We would request we you guys crowd, to just you know, come up. It's like, yeah, that but, helps. See, if you're on an airplane, you have plenty of room for your baggage. So it's, this is yeah. all good. And well, we won't bite for sure. That's, come on, please. Can you guys please move up front? All right, thank you. That's okay. We don't expect anybody to behave. It's, it's human nature that people want to recede to the back, but that's okay. My name is David Yurtz, and I'm with IBI Group. We have Kevin Greiner tonight, and my partner over here is Bankam Kalra. Uh, Bankam and I are both urban planners, land planners, urban designers. We work with communities all over the southeast, and our charge in life for the next, uh, for the past six months and the next four and a half is North Miami. This is where we work. This is our project. We're dedicated to this project, and we spent a lot of time and effort. And we, that's why we appreciate people coming out to listen to us this evening. And then uh, in the rear, we have Ash Rasha with CRA. There she is. And Sam <coughs> with the city, and Debbie. Economic Development Director. Thank you. Debbie up front. And Councilman Galvin, if you could raise your hand, please. There you are. Welcome to this evening. And with that, we'll get started. We have a, a show, and this is really more of a presentation-based uh, pr uh, presentation. It's more of a presentation-based workshop this evening. Although we do have something at the end, we want you to to take part in, where we want you to uh, weigh in on the uh, on the on the results of the uh, of, of the study so far. What we've done, we've had two workshops. This is number three, and the first one and the second one, we had a lot of input, and we've taken all of the information that we've gathered from those first two workshops and put it into a plan. And the plan is guiding principles. It's some of it's physical, and some of it is a little bit uh, uh, futuristic, if you will. And, but most of it is very practical, and, and I think a uh, implementable approach to how we're going to do this mobility hub. Just a quick question. Raise your hands, please. How many are attending for the first time? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, 50%. We like doing this, so yeah. um, this keeps changing. Yeah, David, you've already done that, so I'm going to move forward. This is the study area that we're talking about. We're not looking at the entire city right now. We're looking at a particular part of the area where you're seeing the FEC corridor, the 125th and 123rd Street, and everything within a 10-minute walking distance of this particular intersection. Just to put some images on, we're looking at Biscayne, we're looking at 125th, some neighborhood streets. When you start looking at the extent, this is what we have. And just for orientation, this. That's the, I have to talk to the microphone, it's re being recorded. That's a five points intersection at Biscayne, or I'm sorry, at Dixie, and 6th, 125th. Avenue, 125th, 123rd, Biscayne. So when we had started the study, um, the city had talked about looking at a quarter mile or a five minute walking distance from the train station, the future planned train station at the 125th, 123rd location. And uh, after talking to people and the stakeholders and the kickoff meeting, we realized that in order for the station or whatever to work in downtown, we have to look at a larger area for the mobility to work out. No matter where the station goes, the first and last mile is the most critical part of it. How do you get to the station? The train's not gonna go and drop you off at your home. It's gonna stop at a particular point, so we need to improve the connections between the railroad and the downtown and whatever's happening in between. Keeping that in mind, we had this larger area, which you see, which is the 10-minute walking distance, and we also took a look at the major corridors that are connecting the downtown with the station area. We looked at the fact that within this area you have a population of around 8,000 residents, 3,700 households. It's very diverse, as you could see from the numbers over here. 
it is sort of young in terms of a 36 year median age versus the 37.7 for the city and the median household income is also lower as compared to the rest of the city. That was just a starting point to understand what we're looking at. But at the same time, we realized wherever the station's going to be, whether there's one at the North Miami Beach 163rd, there's also one future infill at 151st or 123rd, this is, okay, this is a station. Whatever comes in North Miami is going to be just one station that's catering to it today. It is going to be looking at a larger area as well on the other side of 95. So we have to start looking at it from a regional perspective or a citywide perspective too. And the reason is if we, when you're viewing these projects, you, you're viewing them as economic development. Economic development goes well beyond the half mile radius that we're dealing with. So we extended that out just from an economic development point of view, not necessarily the stationary plan itself. And this is my totally cool graphic. And if anybody understands that, could you please explain it to me? I did this. Um, Basically what it says is the mobility hub is the center point of the project. The mobility hub takes in pedestrians, it takes in cyclists, it takes in transit, and also the rail station. They're all integrated into one thing. They're all connected by these threads we refer to as roadways and trails and sidewalks. And outlying the study area are certain areas where people tend to congregate. And we've identified three nodes initially a node being a place where people gather together. It's a, um, in one, one of the nodes is, of course, the transit station. The transit station is basically the area that surrounds 123rd, 125th, the railroad tracks itself, and a few of the blocks surrounding that. The second one is the MOCA City Hall, where we're sitting today is a gathering node. We're all together in one spot. And the third one we started looking at was a library. And the reason we looked at the library <laughs> was it seemed to us that that was a gathering spot. The high school's nearby. You got the arts and culture district nearby. So perhaps that's another area that we ought to look at. So that's why, how we arrived at that. And that's a photo from our last meeting. The first workshop. The first workshop was... Ah, yeah. There you are. Look, we have something to prove that you've been attending again and again. Thank you. What we have is... Some of these pressing challenges that came along, traffic congestion, lack of destinations, deteriorating public infrastructure, there were some of these high priority amenities to encourage the use of public transit that were as identified as well. Looking at safer bicycle paths and cycling infrastructure, pedestrian infrastructure. We did a pains and gains exercise where we had people tell us what's actually the pain points, vacant lots, biking is dangerous on 125th road closures that happen, there are shabby entries over here. Also the ones which were programmatic like lack of jobs, lack of community centers. The gains, what would be the gain if the city were to change something? What were those main projects going to be? The signal management, other uses of properties along the railway line, Beautify Biscayne 123rd, police presence, code enforcement, public-private partnerships. These were all really great ideas and we then took them back in the second workshop, we started looking at, all right, we've heard about pedestrian walkways, rail and development. What is the kind of preference of the vis visuals that you would imagine if you start thinking about that? So when we started looking at the wider sidewalks or more street on-street parking as a trade-off, majority of the residents or the participants last time talked about we would want more sidewalks than on-street parking. That's what we would like to see. We would see more space for transit priority lanes than cars. That was a 54%, 46%. So it's somewhere over there that we're talking about. Looking at pedestrian cyclist paths or walkways, which are separated instead of having shadows like the one we have on 125th, which are shared because people felt they were safer. So 90% would want to have separated sidewalks. Rail plus development. 50% shows where you would want to have a plaza looking at another train station, which is not an isolated use, it's just a train station, get something more in the train station. 33% was looking at that with the bus transit system integrated like a multimodal system, which would be there. We talked about how do we change some of these on-street parking areas. The majority of them selected this image from Singapore where uh, 
on-street parking was changed into a bus stop with a library. So what that told us is we're looking at creative uses. We just don't want parking to go away and it's just replaced by another kind of parklet. So there were these parklets that were introduced where you could have more gathering spaces on the street. Open spaces, a lot of it was pedestrian oriented with retail that was being s selected. What type of economic activities would you like to see? 40% talked about future technologies. So we want to see our economic development going towards investment more in future technologies. <coughs> David? And from all of this information that we gathered, we decided collectively and based on the comments we received from, from the city, from the citizens, that there were certain guiding principles that were going to produce this plan and push it forward. And we've listed them. And Bancom already mentioned the first and last mile connectivity. And that's the connecting threads. That's the roads. That's the pedestrian ways, the cycleways. Uh, it has to be multimodal. The integration needs to be not just the train, not just the bus, but also automobiles and transit combined with bicycles and pedestrians. Creative placemaking, and that's kind, of a, that's kind of a planning term, but creative placemaking means we direct this plan toward a certain type of, of brand or look or feel. So the placemaking is a place that says you're in North Miami. And as you drive up and down the eastern coast of Florida, you know you go from one city to the next, to the next, to the next. It's rather seamless. Now, to create an identity is creating a brand, and that's one of the objects. Optimized densification, and that's the D word that everybody hates, density. Nobody likes density. Well, if you're going to do density, and density is important because it creates economic value. It also, can eat, it also creates a uh, critical mass that you need in order for retail and for all the other businesses and other things that you enjoy in terms of leisure to work. So if you're going to do density, it needs to be in the right place, and it needs to be done properly. And of course, transit supported development, and that is mixed use, and it's live work spots. And of course, millennials, like my daughter, for example, who doesn't even own a car, she lives and works on a train line in, in the city of Atlanta. She takes the train to work. So that's important as well. Parking management. There's Just to add to the transit supportive, sorry. One of the other things that we learned during the last workshop with the transit supportive is a lot of the d development that's happening along is very auto-oriented, or for example, storage assets is what we're right. seeing. It needs to become more transit supportive, where you don't need to provide a lot of parking next to transit because that's counterproductive. So the transit supportive uses also talks about discouraging land uses which are going to be generating more traffic. You want to have land uses which are more pedestrian friendly. And economic catalyst, what makes this thing work in terms of economics? What creates dollars and value? Age-friendly neighborhoods. You know, you've got a diverse neighborhood. You've got retirees. You've got young people. You've got uh, families. So you, all these things need to fit together. And the big one, I think, is technology integration. That's the new thing. How does technology work into the neighborhoods and into the fabric of the urban community? Resilient NOMI. That means how are you uh, environmentally friendly? How are you sustainable in terms of... Uh, materials and products, and drainage, that sort of thing. Neighborhood preservation was a big one that came up in one of the workshops. One of the uh, uh, breakout groups we had, please protect the neighborhoods. There's some beautiful neighborhoods in North Miami. The idea is we need to protect those from bad things that could uh, possibly happen. And if, how do we do this effective implementation over time? How do we create a plan that's buildable? All right. Sure. Sorry. 
I, you know, I would use the train all the time. I would use it to go to Fort Lauderdale. I would use it to go downtown. I mean, I'll shoot myself driving Absolutely. to Flagler Street. It's like, the, it's like the worst thing in the world. Yeah. And, and, I, and, and I, I see the connectivity piece missing mm -hmm. in the... In the in well, that give us a... We've got a more slides coming. And, and, that's and then the, that, that's what we're talking about with the first and last mile connectivity is exactly what we're talking about. And it can go further because that's why we got the regional context out as well. It's going to be a series of neighborhoods that's connecting. Yeah. And you can go from the ocean to Oklahoma. Absolutely. 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 And yeah. that's the reason why it yeah. would also have to connect with the smart plan, which the Miami-Dade County is doing. That's something we've taken into account over here as well. So I think the point was well taken, and it is something we're going to be talking about as well as part of the implementation. But I think what is also important is to understand that um, the market conditions which remain in North Miami, we might want a lot of things today, but it's going to be incremental growth that's going to come in. Being in the real estate industry, I'm sure you would understand that we are not talking about changes happening overnight over here. There are going to be some important public realm investments that need to be done, which give the right investment image out there. So we're going to go ahead and uh, go through some of these. David? First and mile connectivity. And you can, you can start to see all the connecting threads in, in North Miami. Boy, that's jittery. <laughs> um, shared mobility, car sharing, bike sharing is a, a new, probably a newer concept. But that means that there are different ways of traveling rather than just a single person in a car. Cycling is big. Cycling is big. Uh, identifying the corridors that work for cycling are more important than uh, in this community than others because there's very busy streets that we want to avoid, but there's also alternative routes. And walking. The pedestrian environment here needs to be developed a little bit better so that you can get from one point to the next and not feel like you're endangered. So when we're looking at walking, we're also talking about three kind of walking streets that need to be looked at. One is the pedestrian priority streets, the green residential streets, which we're talking about those canopy trees and the canopy streets which are there, as well as shared streets where we could have it being shared with pedestrians as well. For cycling, we're going to go, th we're going through the same recommendations of a bikeway priority network where we're looking at creating a loop which is not looking at 125th per se because we feel that's not as safe as well as having talked to a lot of residents and cyclists over here. We're talking about maybe looking at parallel routes like 7th Avenue, 131st Street, and 127th Street, which could be identified as your bicycle pedestrian or uh, bicycle priority routes rather than thinking everything needs to happen on 125th. Complete streets is a thing which has been going around the world, but in our experience, it doesn't work in all streets. You need the right of way. You need the right kind of uses. Historically, how it's been growing is different. So complete streets would be another thing that has to happen along the larger streets like the Dixie Highways or the Biscayne where you can have transit. That's how the connection would happen with some of these other streets, whether we're looking at 125th. Yeah, because we did look at 125th um, when we did the streetscape design for that, and it was you needed to convey a huge volume of traffic. I mean, that was a given. How do you do complete streets in an environment where you need to convey hundreds of cars an hour every day? So the, the priority became, well, we need to make the sidewalks more workable, create canopy trees, make the retail work, and everything kind of became more global. It's not just 125th, but it's those side streets. One thing I wanted to add is we, uh, we decided that perhaps the, if we're going to go north and south, perhaps a multi-use trail would be another idea we could implement. And that's what that green line is that extends along Little Archer Creek to uh, Enchanted Forest, all the way down along the railroad co uh, corridor to the south. So now we've got, another, we've got another alternative route for bicycles going north and south. And a lot of these streets, what we're showing right now, will have their logical terminus somewhere when we start connecting with the larger plans. Whatever the Miami-Dade County plan is, when the city starts looking at a larger bicycle network plan, these, this is the start, where we start sowing the seeds of the pedestrian and the cycling networks, which would connect the transit station and the downtown and the city hall, the destinations to the rest of the neighborhoods. Right. The shared mobility, there's some that's already existing. Like you had mentioned, the trolley would be good. I used to live in Vancouver for the longest time. I just moved six months ago, and I've been saying that to a lot of people. But for the new people, yes, it's a different lifestyle that you're choosing. And that's the choices of mobility made it happen. I did not own a car for seven years. And my wife did not either. So we would just uh, take 
public bicycle sharing, we would be taking car sharing. Those are things that made it easier and not just the transit system. And that's what we think over here, North Miami is ready to start looking at it because some of that has started. Johnson and Wales have, has a zip car system, car sharing system already in it, needs to connect with the destinations outside and see how that works. Lime bike has already started in North Miami, bicycle sharing is there. How do we expand it to connect that entire network? There are all these starts which are there, which need to be scaled up and connecting at the city wide level. And we started looking at the cross sections of the streets to see what fit, what works, what's viable. 125th Street, as you can see, four lanes of traffic. There is some on-street parking. Uh, when the street is redeveloped, which is coming in the, in the coming months, uh, the bump outs will be added on the north side of the street with canopy trees, which should help the street quite a bit. And uh, the proposed section that we showed on the right is we, we started looking at this also as, and again, creating the brand. And part of that brand is gateway. So where does the gateway go? Originally it was Dixie Highway and 6th. And I said, mm, probably not. Mocha Plaza, City Hall, and that area, the area where we're sitting right now, is probably the real gateway to North Miami. And then on the other side, <laughs> who said that? <laughs> and then on the other side, it's uh, coming up Biscayne. Maybe it's the railroad corridor itself. You know, maybe th where that thing is built, Biscayne and that corridor from Biscayne all the way to the railroad corridor creates also a transition into North Miami. So we're looking at that as well. I think the other idea was to calm the traffic. It's very hard. We, we, when we did our surveys, when we did the things, we saw a lot of people jaywalking, more than a lot of places that we've seen. There's a lot of jaywalkers in North Miami. I'm just being honest with being on the street. I've seen that happening. And that is also not just because they want to jaywalk. Where the crosswalks are, are not at the right position. We have to start looking at mid-block crossings or where the destinations are, where they need to cross. And that's another point which these are details which make a street livable and a city livable that we have to start looking at. Yeah, they were, a lot of them were limping too. We don't know why. Maybe they were. <laughs> and then we started looking at this from a more of what happens in the future and along the gateway. You know, as mixed use comes into downtown and we've got residential downtown, you start creating a little bit more uh, economic development and mass buildings on the right side to plant the ones that are there now. And now it all kind of fits together and looks nice. And then we started looking at bicycle priority. How do you prioritize the bicycles on these streets. Well, this is an existing street. This is an example street, and how do you do that? Well, dedicated bicycle lanes is a safe way to go. The north-south streets, we've identified a few, but the going east and west, the 127th quarter, 131st is another. Those are a couple of those alternative routes for bicycles that work extremely well. Get people off 125th, because Shero, in another language, means you're really risking your life. So we think the dedicated bicycle lanes is the way to go. And I refer to these, these streets going east and west, the 127th all the way up to about 134th, as green streets. They're green because they have a lot of tree canopy. That ought to be preserved. They're very, very nice uh, streets. They don't have a lot of sidewalk amenities, but they're beautiful. That's an example. And how do you uh, amenitize those? You add bicycle lanes, lots of people, and uh, create a little bit different environment for these streets, a little bit less desolate. Yes, ma'am. And part of the, the plan is the, how, do you tra mm -hmm. how do you calm the traffic mm -hmm. coming down the street? And part of that is adding the – people will slow down if there's things that are – that make it feel like they're driving unsafely, and the bicycle lanes is one. Yeah, I think traffic calming is something traffic that we're also looking at, speed bumps like we had talked about. On these streets, when you make it a priority, that's the important part. Yeah. These are bike priority, pedestrian priority streets that we're looking at. But there has to be an effort to, to think about that stuff and implement it. Well, there's other ways to do it, too. You know, the intersections could be re re redesigned to maybe more of a, like a roundabout kind of thing where you actually have to go around something in the median. <laughs> so there's different ways to do traffic calming. Yeah, a lot of people don't like the bumps. Yeah. 
And perhaps the seeing the images helps as well. You know, saying we need this or we need that creates a little bit of a, you know, a sort of a confrontational approach. But if you can, this is what it could look like. This is what we're looking for. And you get enough neighbors in, involved and you get enough push behind it, perhaps that's a little bit uh, better way to approach it. I don't know. But just, I just have a question for clarification. Yeah. Is that for all streets, even residential and neighborhood streets, that that can't happen? Okay. Okay. Right. So I think the low cost effective things what we're talking about, we haven't shown any of these. We'd have to start thinking more creatively on where the cost doesn't come onto the city as well for solutions when we're talking about that. Right, David? Yes, absolutely. Sure. Bicyclists too or traffic? You're talking about automobile. Yeah, the, the comment was, uh, yeah, well, sorry, we, it's being recorded. Sure, I said uh, I live on 131st Street, and I can share with you that, that we're very upset with the way the, the cars are rushing back and forth. Uh, I would be nervous to have a bike lane on there unless we can come up with a solution to slow the traffic down. Yeah, okay, good point. Wait now. In Keystone Point, they have the speed hump. Bike, but they do have them in there, and they're not as engaged. And I guess there's a bump that's easier to post over those, and they actually kind of don't look as bad. Yeah. I'll show you that, but I'm just saying. If yeah. In 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 my neighborhood, the uh, the neighbors have put up these little these placards with a guy that says. Uh, pretend that your children live in this neighborhood, and and they put them right into the into the street, <laughs> and that tends to slow people down. <laughs> All right. All right. Point taken. I have a very simple solution to this. In the surrounding cities. They have police cruisers, you know, where they have problems with the people speeding through them. Like, the, the, I've never seen a police officer give a ticket in this city ever. And I've been here nine years. So people go against the traffic, they push you, they go 50, 60 miles an hour, 70 miles on 120 feet. And uh, but just with pol police presence, you know, put a police patrol there, put a cruiser there, and start giving tickets. Yeah. And there are, Biscayne Park, they don't even think about speeding, and they're I'm serious. Gonna, I'm going to assume that the people are taking these streets as an alternative to 125th, right? The pass through. Yeah, 124, yeah. all of them are alternatives when the traffic is bad, when yeah. the train is passing. People, co they, they'll yeah. go against the traffic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. More police. Sorry about the microphone, but it's being recorded, so. And again. Getting back to the, one of the ideas that uh, occurred to us, and it came up in a, one of our public meetings, was multi-use trails and accommodating bicycles. And I said, well, I, you know, I lived in Atlanta, and, and one time I lived near the Beltline Trail in Old Fourth Ward. And when I started living there, the Beltline was just an idea that somebody had. They built the first section of it, and everyone said, well, this is dopey. No one's going to use it. It's in a high crime area. If you go back there today, it's created, with a B, $2 billion in economic development on a trail similar to this, adjacent to a, a, an old vacated railroad corridor. So this is our vision for FEC Railroad Corridor with a multi-use trail 
running parallel to it that then, again, it connects from near the Parker Recreation Facility at the south all the way to uh, Enchanted Forest to the north. But you can see this is, what, this is what happened in Atlanta, and it's happened in other places, where the development pushes right up to the trail. Now, the trail conveys bicycles, and it conveys pedestrians, but these bicycles and these pedestrians use all the businesses on that trail. They don't drive in. They're on bicycles and they're pedestrians. So it's an interesting idea. And, and we are aware that these are going to be challenges to work with FEC or whoever owns the right of way. But this is a plan which we're looking at 10, 15, 20 years from now. And we have to fight for a lot of these things, whether it's the speed humps or whatever we're doing, we'd have to start looking for some opportunities which is going to change because otherwise it's going to be everywhere. And the county is also talking about rails to trails in their long range plan. So these are things that we have to say as the community, whether we approve of this or not, like we just learned about the speed humps, is something hard to do, fine, we'll look at different solutions. So the reason why we're sharing it with you is, tell us, you like this or you don't like it. So yeah. there will be an opportunity where at the end, we'll ask you to sit down, tell us, good idea, bad idea, what we showed. And what are the challenges and how do we overcome those challenges? Figure out a strategy for doing that. The other thing we talked about was multimodal integration, which is looking at, as you had mentioned, the Nomi Express is a wonderful service that's there right now. How do we start expanding that to connect better, have more frequency that happens with that? The other thing we're looking at is the beginning is what we're calling the Nomi Pivot is what needs to happen is we need a destination for people from different modes to come over here to start realizing the vision we're talking about. Right now, the MOCA, the City Hall, it's there, but there's not enough happening over here. People aren't stopping over here for more than their usual work. So we need to start creating that destination. One of the ideas that we were looking at was a pivot, which is, again, making this as a multimodal hub in the parking lot. There's nothing else. We're not tearing down any buildings, nothing. The parking lot needs to start becoming something more than just a parking lot. And logistically, that's right over there. That's what that yes. is. Yes. So we're talking about, again, having some electrical vehicle charging, long-term parking, car rental, car share, bike share. All the modes start coming in, which is a message that we're sending to everyone who wants to invest or move to know me is we are talking about sustainability at all levels. So this is one of the ideas that we have, wor we're working with the city's transportation and we're proposing this to the county as well to see if this can be used as a pilot project to go for a grant. So that is one of the projects that we will be looking at. The other thing that we're talking about is new regional bus routes. There are, the bus system exists and again, I am a little biased because, like I said, I lived in Canada and Vancouver. The transit was not there next to my house. The rail transit wasn't, but the bus service was really good. We just took buses everywhere. So to start working with the county to invest in better buses, better frequency is going to be something which is what we recommend we need to start pushing for as a city as well. The other thing is the quiet zone, which is when the trains are going to come in, we'd have to start thinking about looking at a quiet zone in this area near the railway, yeah. railroad tracks as well. And we did visit uh, West Palm Beach, their train station, a few weeks ago, and they said the train doesn't, they don't sound the horn coming through. It's, it's quiet. So that's one thing to look at as well. They, they pardon me? I, I see a lot of cars that just want to sit and lie on the tracks. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So as a city, we do have to make sure that we have that in advance that this is our station needs to also have that quiet zone. Some people like that lonesome whistle, <coughs> but if you're living next to it, I'm telling you, it's not that much fun. It <laughs> is. I live next to it right now. Yeah. I do live on Dixie Highway, so I do get the bright line. It doesn't stop in Boca, but it goes from West Palm to Fort Lauderdale, and I'm just at Dixie, and uh, uh, there's another place called Hidden <laughs> Valley, and the yeah. train comes every night. Earlier, it was an issue when I moved to there, and I could hear it. It's just right there. You know, we just started feeling okay with it. We got used to it, felt like Harry Potter in the beginning that my wife and I are like, whoa, look, Hogwarts Express is here now. But then it went on and we are used to it. We don't hear it anymore. It gets, people get used to it. I assure you, I've lived in these core areas. When you're close to it, it's just white noise after some time. Now we need it to have a good sleep. <laughs>
The other thing which we acknowledge is industrial streets that are important, and we need to start looking at that. There's a lot of truck traffic that would come in, and it keeps coming, and we need to start looking at how do we prioritize those streets, what are the changes that need to be done for that as well. Because a lot of them would be cutting through neighborhoods sometimes if, whenever the whole transformation happens, that we just need to make sure that we're looking at the service or truck access and the service alleys as a priority as well because we have very limited right of ways in North Miami when we look at 125th or 123rd or 126th. Right. I think what we're, what we're going with is there's no elimination right now. The market is going to define. It's easy to say that, yes, we want that. Already the city has its zone for everything else. Mm -hmm. Until and unless the market is there, we can't change it. We can't change it. And what we're looking at is also a progression. There would be certain things that need to change. The industrial can still remain. One of the questions that we had in the first workshop was what would you like to see instead of the industrial? People talked about entertainment, brewery district, something like that could be transformed with arts district. It's a possibility. Winwood was an example people threw out that, hey, we would love, if this is changing, we would love to have that kind of a use coming in. So we've got all that open. We're not being very prescriptive of what is the use that's going to come in. Yeah. What's going to be important is how does it connect to the neighborhoods. There's a hundred examples of repurposing industrial sites. There's also a hundred examples of industrial sites that have improved on their own and others that have just been removed and replaced with other things. So it's probably market driven. We just don't know. Your favorite one. Go for it, man. Creative placemaking, yes. <laughs> Everybody says, what's placemaking? Well, placemaking is creating environments and uh, places for people to gather and feel comfortable. And also, they all, they're economic development centers. They're places where money is exchanged in terms of uh, restaurants and uh, residential, that sort of thing. So we have identified a number of them. Number one, of course, is Nomi Station. That's right at 123rd, 125th, and FEC. We would view that as a, as a redevelopment node. Mocha Plaza is another number two. Number three is the 8th Avenue Corridor, and that was identified by the city of North Miami as a green corridor, but we see it as, a, we refer to it as an open street, which means it's multimodal, it's pedestrian friendly, doesn't have a lot of car traffic on it. Number four is the public market and arts area, and that could go anywhere, but we identify that particular site. And the library plaza is one of mine that I thought, I squinched my eyes when I was looking at the Google Maps and I visited, we, we've driven by it a half a dozen times. I, this area has a lot of kids, a lot of high school students that hang out there. They don't have a place to go. There's nothing there to do. Why not redevelop that site as well? And of course, food truck plazas, which is Bongham's favorite because he likes to eat, as you can <laughs> see. Um, the food truck plazas are kind of a mobile thing that goes from place to place. One of the ideas we had toyed around is why not do sort of a demonstration project here at Mocha Plaza, bringing in food trucks and sort of a festival idea, and then recapturing 8th Avenue as an as a open street just for a day. And we can refer to that. Can I mention this? Sure, man. We can mention the tactical urbanism because I like the way it sounds. It's tactical urbanism, which is the planning term for recapturing a street just for an, on a temporary basis. Sometimes it becomes permanent. Basically, what you do is you take the street, you put in temporary things like planters and barriers, and you bring in a lot of people, and you have a festival for the day where the street doesn't function as it normally would from Monday to Friday. Anyway. We also started looking at station plan alternatives. And again, you can look at this picture from 20 to 30 years out, or you can look at it from how do we implement this project immediately? How do we do something that's realistic that we can do in the short term? If we're going to do the station, and, and if it is at 125th, 123rd, and 13th, 14th, then these are ideas on how it might work. On the left side, you see the the corner, I refer to this corner as the northwest node or quadrant, and that's where 13 goes north. It's one parcel, it's one lot with the station on it with parking and the platform for the station. Number two is on the other side of the tracks. Again, one parcel, redevelop the building that's there, create the parking so you create the station at a relatively low cost. 
our recommendation is the 125th, 123rd Street in whatever analysis we've done as opposed to the 151st right now. But again, it's about when you start looking at it at a city level and a regional level, it makes more sense to have it in your core. But if 151st comes first, fine. There's no reason why 125th, 123rd wouldn't. But we have to fight for it and show our vision for it. And that's what we're trying to do over here. Yes, sir. Okay, but I, I would say that it can still be built. It will be there if you all are saying what you're saying today and we can go and say it in the TPO meeting. Please do that because they need to hear it. What we've been hearing from the community is the 123rd and 125th, and that's why we're showing that. And that's what I would request you all to please just stick to that because it makes all sense, like the economic sense. Sorry, go. I think that's what we want. Absolutely. And, and that's what... All right. Where is the TPO meeting going to be? It's, uh, it's down here in Beverly Center on Thursday next week. Thursday next week. These spaces are going to be the first four spaces, 39th Street, 79th Street, 151st and 161st Street. 123rd Street was never mentioned in the discussion. And again. But it was in that original plan, the tri-rail plan shows one plan. Absolutely, and that's the reason why we have this conversation and the city and the CRA of North Miami took that decision to go ahead with this study to show them that we're ready. The community is behind this as our preferred and the only alternative. We're Twenty-fifth. Yes. Okay. Point taken. We all agree with that. Now what we're also talking about is optimized densification. We do not, around the globe when you start TODs coming along, you also have to start looking at how do you preserve the existing neighborhoods. The general perception is the moment you start talking about transit and development, the densities everywhere have to go high. We've seen this, we've done it everywhere, it doesn't work like that. There is a market, there are going to be certain sites you want to start strategically and that's what we call as optimized densification. Where your infrastructure can take the capacity, where your roadways can take the capacity is where we have identified more need for development. Right? So what we also did was looked at just a comparison of the current codes and started comparing that to Miami, Delray Beach, Fort Lauderdale, what are we looking at the current zoning codes and what, where are we? We're doing pretty okay and still we don't have a lot of development. There's no more density that's needed to be offered per se to the developers to come in. If there is a market, they would have jumped for it. There isn't that big of a market. So the community needs to start understanding that in certain locations, density is going to be pushed for because we don't want it to encroach into the neighborhoods. That's what the city's whole purpose is and that's what we're trying to also identify that when you start assembling properties, there is enough that we can create which can be catering to the market. These are some of those different uh, options that we have seen. Just to compare it with Miami when you start looking at, one of the things that we will be working with is also to start defining the built form, which is when Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Delray Beach, they're starting to talk about a podium and a tower kind of a configuration which is what is not existing in terms of the design guidelines right now, which we will be working with the city and proposing as part of the TOD plan, where you are able to have higher densities, but they're not just towers that are coming up. You need to have two or three stories up front, then you step back, then you go higher. 
So these are things which we are sharing with the city right now as well and discussing with the planning staff. And it's going to be available to you online to look at it, just to understand what we're doing right now is not as intense as what we see everywhere else. But we still are pretty good in terms of Delray Beach, a similar kind of neighborhoods. We're there. Yes. The tower plan. Not everywhere. At certain locations, yes, we would have to, where there is intensity in terms of the traffic capacity can be taken. We're not talking about neighborhoods. What but are yes, yes. For now, there are certain places which need to be upgraded. There is density that's allowed. And there's density that the market is willing to give. It's the community who needs to just decide, yes, this is where we would want the densities. It shouldn't be going everywhere. Like the planned development corridor or the planned uh, corridor district, which is there, it has densities which are good enough right now for us to start seeing those developments coming along. David? Uh, OK. Am I? OK, um, this is a kind of an aerial view looking at the TOD area and then the ultimate build out 30 years from now or whenever. But well, the idea, we, what we're trying to do, if you can go to the previous slide, please. That's what's there. That's what's there. It's industrial sites. It's uh, no residential at all in, the, in this area that we're talking about around the TOD. It's all industrial. It's all warehouse buildings and what I refer to as metal buildings, what can happen? Well, so we started looking at it from a very futuristic point of view. Mix, mixed use, uh, how does a station work? Well, you need a bridge over the top. Most of these train stations have a uh, station on one side, station on the other, and you have to get over the tracks, excuse me, so you have to get over the tracks, so there's a, a bridge. So we've added that, and it's lovely. And then you start looking at how it happened. From the south end, there's no green space, there's no spaces for people, for recreation. So there is a, a large parcel in the southeast quadrant that's open and green. Why not create a park on the other side, the park and recreation site as well? And we have some other ideas for that too, but that becomes the park anchor at the south. We've got another, you can't see it on this slide, another park anchor at the north, and you've got the connecting thread of the FEC trail that connects the north and the south quadrant together. And in between, you've got development. You've got mixed use, you've got office, you've got residential, uh, you've got a train station, multimodal with buses, vehicles, bicycles, pedestrians, a vibrant and growing area. And the library, this is where the, the, the way the library node looks today. It's 8th, it's Dixie. There's not a whole lot of pedestrian use there that is really viable. The gray area is parking, the buildings are white, and it's it's not very attractive, quite frankly, but it tends to do, it, there's a lot of people there. There's a lot of students there from the high school. There's a lot of activity going on. They just don't have any things to do. There's not enough activity centers. Started going back and looking at the library, redeveloping that parking lot in front of the library, is a bus turnaround, and then across the street, a little plaza, a little pedestrian space there, and reconfiguring the parking, so the same amount of parking is there, but pushing it away, organizing it, creating pedestrian space, and then connecting it across Dixie Highway to the arts community and with startups in the, in the arts and culture district, live-in artists that they have in a lot of communities where you know you have an artist that lives in the house, sell their wares, sell their art, art material right out of the home itself. And then MOCA, City Hall, this is the 3D that's existing today. You can see the police, uh, City Hall, MOCA, and of course the uh, development along 125th. And then the big gray area is parking. Now the future plans call for this to be redeveloped into a parking garage on 25th, 125th, another parking garage south of the police station, the new city administration building to the right, and this whole, this whole get area gets, let me, yeah, I, let me finish. So the idea is to, Mocha Mocha Plaza is the focus of this, and Mocha Plaza becomes redeveloped into a, a real pedestrian space. It's mm -hmm. not a real usable space, though, in our view. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
We're not filling it. We are read of. Uh, are you talking about the area to the south? Yeah, the plaza. The plaza is up the there still. Up here. The, the plaza is still up there. We've retained the plaza. We're not talking about removing all that. No. What what we're talking about is somewhere a lot of these city-owned properties that we have, which are parking lots right now, would need to be repurposed for other users. It doesn't have to be just the city hall. We do understand that. It could be something else. It could be a hotel, which comes in over here. It would be some use that needs to make this more vibrant, which we, we all understand that. We're not talking about the users over here, what the use is going to be. But the intent is to just get your feedback on whether we're open to start looking at some more activities coming in this area. Right now, just having the public facilities over here is not the highest and best use of these prime location lands that we have. So we're talking about not making it completely built. All of these are going to be a series of connected plazas, not just the Mocha Plaza. We're talking about having more events, more programming that needs to be done. Yes, there are events which are there, but what happens before and after that? Mm -hmm. Those two or three hours where we have the jazz festival, it's fine. But when we start looking at Delray Beach, Atlantic Avenue, or the old school square, there's a lot more happening throughout the day. And that's what we think the city needs now. This is the destination that needs to be created consciously. The, all right. the other thing what we're talking about is the transit supportive development, where we're saying that here, which is the one that you see, is we need to ha start having some kind of the users that we're talking about have a railroad entertainment district, like I had mentioned, that starts coming over here. So those are the kind of uses the city projects that we're trying to attract. When we're looking at all these, the number two is where we start seeing the Main Street, 125th Street, Main Street kind of a atmosphere that's created over there. We're again not talking about five stories, three stories. Closest that I can think of is Delray Beach right now, which the, I don't know if you've been to Delray Beach, Atlantic Avenue, there are some Apartments that are coming over there, which is just over retail, two or three stories, that's what we feel would be the character of this. The transit neighborhoods are an important part because the reality is 151st, even if you look at the numbers, the ridership is not there. The ridership is actually over here. So 123rd, we need to preserve and strengthen this wherever there is infill opportunity for more multifamily coming in, we have to start looking for that as well because we want to make sure, and which is the case right now, there's a lot of people who have been here, who are living over here, and we need to treat them as neighborhoods. Nothing's happening inside once you go in. Most of it is along the frontage of the corridors. The fourth we're looking at is the Biscayne Boulevard commercial corridor, because when you, the railroad in a lot of places divides the city into different sections. So this is another example of that, but we have to make that conscious effort to start connecting this. You've got the Johnson and Wales University, the students. Yes, they're there, but it's right now an island on its own. We need to let it start, and we're working with them. They're working on the campus master plan as we speak. We are working with them to tell them, let's think outside, not inside for the campus master plan. Let the campus start floating into the city as well along the Biscayne Boulevard. The other thing we're looking at is the 123rd Street after the railroad is looking at that as a mixed-use district as well in the coming future, which is connecting the railroad and Biscayne. It has older kind of uh, apartments with large parking lots. How do you start putting things on those parking lots? We need, we, one thing is for sure, the city is ready for a multi-level parking, like a parking garage needs to happen in the city sometimes. Whether it happens with a private sector entity in it, it becomes like a mixed-use parking garage, you have retail, there are really cool parking garages in Miami. Is one of those places which has been very innovative with parking garages. It doesn't have to look really sore and eyesore. So those are the five kind of districts that we're talking about which complete this whole story. It's not just about looking at densities everywhere. We want you to please understand that and we want your input on that as well, feedback on that. We're looking at a complete community which is going to have diversity of housing, diversity of people living over here, mixed income housing. And we're also saying that, yes, we will be looking at working on seeing what the existing overlay designations, the NRO and the PCB, how do we start including a lot more of this. Once we start talking about parking, it's very important when the city would grow, you would have to, when you put a parking garage in and things would happen, 
pricing is something which would need to happen on certain streets. You'd have to start paying for parking on the streets. It is a priority, it's a luxury, yes. So that would be something the city needs to start looking at. Not on all streets, but where the traffic is. The other thing which needs to be done is reduce parking standards. We have a lot, very high parking standards over here as compared to the neighboring communities as well. We have to start looking at that as well. We are talking about also looking at mandatory workforce and affordable housing that needs to come in, the new developments that are coming in. That has to become a part of the regulations as well. There are these things when we're talking about density bonuses that are be given, we need to start, and we already have that language, we just need to pu put it on this, is to exchange for public realm improvements like public plazas, affordable housing. You get more density or more height if you're able to do something for the public realm. It's an exchange, which a lot of communities around the world do in the TOD areas. Miami 21 does that same thing. We're talking about some of these options that are there as the proposed parking sites which exist. Any of these, wherever we're, the city is ready to build this right now, or there's a public sector or private sector interest, we'd have to start looking at that. The other thing which will happen is using technology again. How do you, like when you're going to the airport, you know how many parking spaces are where. And that's somewhat what we're trying to get towards is let's start using technology and mobile technology to start telling people when they're out there rather than going in circles, trying to look for their parking. All right, these are the parking spaces available over here. The city will have to grow into that in the next five, 10 years when we're looking at that. We're just setting the base on, yes, let's get ready for it, whatever needs to be done for that. And the economic catalysts, what are they? Well, we're looking at the, the transit hub as an economic catalyst. The station comes in, things happen around it. And one of the ideas, too, was d repurposing some of the buildings that are out there. And there's plenty of examples of that, like uh, the goat farm, there's Wynwood, there's other types of redeveloped areas where they've taken old industrial buildings, recreated Yeah, that's the West Palm Grandview. That's, again, an industrial area that was repurposed. Yeah, that's all repurposed. It's not something that's been torn down. It's been re redeveloped into something different. So the, and these are some photographs of things that have happened. In the, that's an industrial site in the upper left-hand corner. And you know, 15 years ago, it was vacant buildings and, and disrepair. And again, there's not a whole lot of investment in here, but there's a whole lot of people now in restaurants and art festivals and so forth. So we're looking at that. The technology uh, startup incubators is another. And uh, again, technology is the new, the new thing. You know, our company is rolling out what we refer to as smart cities. Smart cities really is integrating all these new technologies into the urban fabric, and that's one of the things we'll be looking at. One of the things that we think has been overlooked that we ought to take a more serious look at is student housing. How do we take the Johnson Wales University and create value from the student body that's over there? Housing and uh, connectivity from the university down to the, to the train station itself. Promotion of festival arts and repurposed sites. We already talked about that and reimagining Mocha Plaza as a high impact uh, event. I know people say, we don't want to change it. We're not talking about changing the site, the size or the shape of it, but adding amenities to it. And maybe it's just electric, maybe it's technology, other things that make it more viable. Trees, more shade, mm -hmm. more that sort of thing. And then of course the complete streets program, promoting connectivity throughout the city, but there's gonna be some resistance to changing the fabric of those streets and turning the the cross-section of these streets into something a little bit more bicycle friendly, but these are all changes that we think are important. I think just to add to the technology startup incubators, Kevin, who is our economist, he's going to be presenting after this, Miami has one of the highest densities of sm startups in the country, in the world or the country? country? Country. All right, in the country. And so we want to start looking at being forward thinking on that and see how can we tap on that? How can all these lands that we have, the industrial sites that we have, how can that be repurposed for something which is like a co-working space or something, an incubator for startups to come over here? Because Miami is expensive, yes. North Miami is going to be also expensive, but it's more affordable right now as you compare to the larger market. That is one of the reasons why, and we heard that people had told us that we have to start looking at future technologies as one of the economic drivers. We really feel, Sam, you're here, we would have to start looking at that as one of what what would it take to get that incubator started up over here as well this is the parks and recreation property and and you saw one of the plans we had shown this is the very south end of the 
uh, TOD node. This is on the park and recreation property. Right now, it's buildings that store things, basically. And of course, there's a school to the, uh, to the uh, west. But we look, we're looking at this as a catalyst project, as a, an easy, low-hanging fruit kind of project. Redevelop these buildings into, repurpose these buildings into some kind of a uh, arts yes. and culture center, that yeah. sort of I thing. I think we like had this. the public market. We had that as an idea that this south side also gets connected. We need a destination on that side. And a city-owned property, if we start looking at a public market, similar to the West Palm Beach, or we're looking at you know, somewhere like Wynwood, but some destination with a parks component because we're very, very low on parks and open space and recreation space in this 8,000, 10,000 resident area. There's hardly any recreation facility within a 10 minute walk. So we want the parks and recreation facility, which is for storage and everything else, we see that being repurposed as well to have a recreation facility in it as well as also looking at something like a public market, an arts plus public market where people could come and the whole community could gather there as well. And i uh, give you an example. In, the, in Birmingham, uh, Alabama, one couple came in and redeveloped the building into a, a restaurant. And there's some, they, they have a live music there. They have a different things happening. But it's one building on a main street that they redeveloped on their own. They were pioneers. They moved in in a wagon and they did this thing. Now the entire street is being redeveloped. That one spark then created more and more interest. And all of a sudden, everybody says, well, what a great idea. We need to come down there. So now the whole street is being redeveloped. Yes, sir. Yeah, usually um, when government gets involved in a project, well, it kind of fits. Usually it's private entities like you see with the Roman here. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. It would be a public private venture. The city is just going to get the land ready to be give, handed over to the private sector. That's right. how we're seeing it. The city is not developing it with their own funds. No. It's the city ha owns the land, but and that gets ready. The city owns the garment so we can streamline the process. Mm -hmm. That's our hope as well. That's and I our said, hope well, as well. I said, what was the first step? The first step was we went to the city yeah. and we said, what's, what's, what's possible here? What's allowable? What can we do? And the city said, well, you know, there's, there's certain restrictions and we can help you with this and this and that in terms of the permitting and getting things built and getting through the code process. So, yeah, the city supports it, but not financially, but in regulatory ways. Yeah. We, we, we hear you, sir. We definitely hear you. We are talking about that as well because we've heard that. Can you just give us two more minutes so we can finish this? You had a, qu a statement, right? Yeah. I Please. Just want to say that at one point we started to think that the path to a development um, was going to be one thing to have it and have it open to the public and the private sector and all that. But right now, we have very little Absolutely. That, that we totally agree with that. No, no, it, no it doesn't get handed over. That's the reason why you will have a public component as well. The city would keep owning the land. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Green space. Absolutely. Well, sometimes it's the private sector that does that with an incentive, and it, it works all the time. It hasn't worked. Pardon yeah. me? Yeah. It hasn't worked over here yet, but this is the change. The change starts now. Mm -hmm. no, that's not coming. Yeah, all right. Well, I, I guess I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share. This is off topic a little bit, but when 
I was on the City of Atlanta Design Review Board, and there were several people, 10 or 12 people on this board, and we were designers, we were architects, and then some engineers and, and uh, landscape architects. So this guy, this young student comes in, and he shows us this idea of his, and the idea was to vacate a railroad corridor to create a pedestrian path. And most of the people in the room said, wow, this guy, this kid is crazy, isn't he? Well, sitting next to me was a gentleman that I knew very well from Perkins and Will, and he said, wow, that's a good idea. I said, that is a great idea. Somebody needs to jump on this. That was in 2001. That was 15, 17 years ago, and that became the Atlanta Beltline. So sometimes all you need is that spark and that first step, and that creates the rest. So that's kind of, that's why we're looking at these catalyst projects as starting points. They're not all that dramatic, you know, they're very simple. But what they do is they create an atmosphere for success, and that's what we're trying to do. And we're going to be taking that out again. It's, it's about we're getting your input. We're going to be looking for developers or investors or the city. We need to get them excited about what North Miami is thinking, which is together everything. We're not just talking about single properties right now. We're talking about the overall thing being developed. One of the things that we kept hearing in the last two or three months was this whole thing that there is a lack of transparency. We don't know what's happening. There is a lot of it, which is the governance needs to be looked at, the decision making, the streamlining isn't there. And that's something which we've taken into account. And although it doesn't fall completely under the purview of looking at transit and development, what we are recommending and we've started talking to the city about is that a lot of cities around the country are doing this, which is to improve the efficiency of government is to start looking at technology integration, which means whatever is happening in the city is also not just files which you have to download. These are dashboards that are going to be available for the citizens. You are essentially creating a kind of a resident engagement platform. You don't have to wait for these community workshop meetings to happen. There is going to be an ongoing portal that's going to be there, which is going to let you do that. And I will go through it for this particular project as well. We are doing this, and we're going to be sharing it with you in the next week or so, where you could go in and tell us your comments on all the ideas that we're giving you, which would go back to the city. They're going to start seeing what you guys are supporting, what you are not supporting. We're just trying to make it more accessible for you, not just the six to eight meeting that we're talking about. You have an multiple options to go ahead. The other thing which is looking at city project mon monitoring the plans, the zoning amendments that are happening. They happen, they get minuted, but wouldn't it be nice for you guys to just go ahead, or the city, different departments, to go ahead and look at, all right, these were the zoning amendments that went through. What is the history of this? Did we approve that? We're looking at, looking at economic development, the building permits that were issued. What are the sites available? All those sites that we're seeing to get developers. Right now, it's a very cumbersome process in the city to even get that building permit happening. As I've been talking to a lot of people, it's just, it's not that easy. And in today's day and age, it is very easy. It's just a software off the shelf with an ERP system, which is an enterprise system, and they come and automate your building permits. And so everything's happening online. Miami-Dade County has that as well. So now we have to start looking at that. I'm sorry? Yes, we do have that same thing. As I, I, that's what I'm saying. What we have to start doing is, is just getting people to use that more and make it more available for everyone to start looking at it in a co comprehensive fashion. The other thing we're talking about is a common mobility app. The buses, when are the buses going to come? It's already started, which is when is the Miami-Dade County bus coming in, the Nomi Express. So on your phone, you don't have to sit and wait for the bus. You could see, all right, I can leave 10 minutes late because the bus is stuck somewhere. So you start looking at using technology to let you control how you're going to be moving around the city. The other thing which is very important is investment in high-speed broadband, which is when we start talking about future technology as the incubator, we need to have Wi-Fi downtown. The streamlined development process, the automated building permits, plan approvals, all that is something which needs to come together on one thing where you all can go and access it. How many of you use the online building permit application as it is. Do you use the online chain? No. Yeah? I don't. I don't. I looked up, I looked up what the permits are for my Florida Chamber of Commerce, and that has stuff on it, and it has stuff that's 
So I think for us, it's just a matter of there's a lot that the city has invested. We just need to start sharing it with the community and the development community as well. Right now, the perception is it's really hard. But there's a lot that has been done. We just need to bring that up. It's gotten better, which is a good thing. Jessica, after this, please, please, can we? I do. Isn't that, you're popular, <laughs> you're famous. Um, we're talking about resilient Nomi. What we're saying is from a land use perspective, we, we are in a place. Miami is one of the 100 resilient cities that was selected like that, Miami, Dade County, and Kevin will be talking about it a lot. We're talking about looking at land use, we have to concentrate high density de development and higher elevation areas. We can't let it be going everywhere in the city because that's not smart. If we're talking about smart city, smart development, it's not smart. We're talking about preserving and strengthening the existing residential areas which are in those higher elevation areas. We're also talking about looking at infrastructure. There's a lot of work that's being done at the county level which needs to start coming at the city level, which we have a sustainability coordinator, the city has one, is working with it. The strategic Miami area rapid transit plan, which is happening right now, we are a part of it. A lot of the changes that you're talking about are gonna come through the county. It's not the city going beyond that, it will be the county that's servicing that. We're talking about also looking at pedestrian first and transit first, policies in all development projects, which means let's stop thinking about cars. We have to start thinking about people more and more and more. We're talking about, again, having a smart decision making for resilience. How do you start looking at performance management, environmental protection and enhancement? Those are things that are gonna happen. Kevin, after the sea level thing, do you wanna just step in, please? You can take it from the resilience as well since you are an expert on it in the Region. Uh, well, uh, let me let me get down to to sea level rise at the end. Um, the first thing to always keep in mind: mobility. The future of North Miami is small businesses. It's economic future. You just don't have large sites. Um, it already is a community of small businesses. That's its strength. So the future of North Miami is is the growth of small businesses. Why all of this matters and all of these issues are connected. Investments in mobility are actually one of the smartest ways to promote the development of small businesses. What you're really doing is offsetting a lot of cost by improving local mobility, making it easier for workers to get to North Miami, making it easier for people to move around inside North Miami is a major, actually, investment and subsidy and support of small businesses. Because remember that sitting in a car Commuting an hour, commuting 45 minutes is an expense for an employer and the employee. Parking is an expense for the employee, sometimes for the employer. So everything you do to improve mobility is actually a really important economic investment you're making in small business development. The problems, biggest problems Miami, North Miami faces, we, we've actually documented a number of issues, but the three most important issues um, one is that household incomes are still much lower than the rest of the county uh, in North Miami, and the county is lower than the rest of the country. That's a real issue here. So people aren't earning what they should be in, in North Miami. Uh, the other really interesting misfit, though, is that North Miami, when you look at the businesses that are here, you look at the income that's being paid to employees, North Miami is actually an oasis of rather high paying jobs. There are a number of professionals, management professionals, healthcare, so that it's about now 47% of the businesses in, in North Miami are in industries that are paying above the county median wage. So there's actually a fair number of jobs that pay more than the county median um, and they're in really interesting occupations. The third biggest issue the really sad, unfortunate side of it is there's a mismatch between the residents of North Miami and the jobs that are here. Only 6%, there are 42,000 jobs uh, in and around North Miami. 42,000 jobs. Unfortunately, of all the employed residents that live in North Miami, only 6.6% .6 actually live and work in North Miami. A big chunk of the residents of North Miami get up every day and have to leave, and the average commutes now are approaching about 40 minutes, so they're actually leaving and going a long way. 
that creates a lot of issues because you have you do have a fair number of high paying jobs in 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 professions that require education and with upward mobility a lot of opportunity is lost so that residents who live here aren't getting access to those high quality jobs that are being created in North Miami and that's a fundamental issue um, actually in in professional research attorneys offices health care medical offices Yeah, you And it's it's really is driving your your traffic issues during the day. It's both people leaving and then the workers coming in to take those jobs. So the jobs are jobs are being created here. What we're recommending is a is a is seven quick points to begin with is continue to target the development of those high income jobs. Yes. Percentage percentage looks like the rest of the county. Um, it was much higher, but after recession has has slipped. So now it's a higher percentage of renters, and the entire country is going that way. Yeah, people are people are preferring to move back into rental now, and that's where the market's going. Um, but continue to target the development and support the development of high income jobs. High income jobs, uh, it really that's what drives the rest of the economy. The issues with start with promoting the development of low income jobs is that you're creating really dead ends. They don't create as much spin off activity. They do create entry level jobs for a lot of people, but you really need a balance in that. So continue policies that really support the development of higher income jobs, higher income occupations. Those spin off a lot more jobs and create a lot more economic multipliers. So key important part of your future economic development policy. Um, supporting small business growth. And everything you've seen up here, like I've said, supports small business, small business growth. Continue to promote those policies. There are a number of specific land, pol land use policies you can do to do that as well. Um, the amount of, and, and Bonkham pointed out, the square footage that's possible. Just on the properties in and around the pro proposed station area. Um, built out at the current, current zoning that the city already has on those properties, you're talking about significant opportunity. This is somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,000 potential housing units if developed that way. It has the potential, because of the way people work, and I'll talk about that later, uh, to creating somewhere in the neighborhood of five to 8,000 new jobs. So these are significant opportunities, and that's just really in the station proximity. So there's really big opportunity to create those new small businesses and support them. Work shift strategies. The way we work and where we work has changed dramatically in the last 25 and is years. It's continued to change very fast. And this is where mobility really continues to support the way we work. 25% of the American workforce now works at least some part of the week from home. Depending on what occupation you're in, and it's usually management, higher paying occupations, 40% of workers work at least some part of the week at home, and the amount of hours that people work from home is growing every year. Three last years, national surveys of workers around the country have been asked, well, what's, your, what's actually your, your preferred um, commute? If you're given a choice of either rail or say a, an automated automobile or a car, what's actually would be, if, you, if you're given a choice of how to commute to work, what's your favorite way to commute to work? For the last three years, the top answer is telecommuting, not getting in a car at all. So working from home, that's now actually being traded for income. Large companies, Dell, IBM, others, Dell especially now is, is considered a world leader. They want 98% of their workforce not to come into offices by the year 2025. So these are the kind of commitments, and you see that. So the way we work, where we work, Co-working now, co-working spaces, the Miami metro area is number one in the nation in terms of the percent of co-working space as a percent of its total office space. People are choosing to work differently. They work from home, which leads to the next, uh, leads to the, the next concept in, in what's called work shifting. 
moving away from that concept of people commuting at all and the old kind of, it's, it's really a 1950s notion of living in a suburb, commuting downtown, that's really old school. The idea now and where this all really fits in and where North Miami has an opportunity, a significant competitive opportunity that other communities don't have because of this rail station is that now you have the opportunity to actually keep people off the road completely. And that's huge. I mean, co congestion now is becoming a, a severe competitive problem in Miami-Dade County. Uh, employers around the rest of the nation, and it's a big element of the whole Amazon for formulation. Miami might be much more competitive attracting an Amazon, but they look at now traffic congestion, the lack of, of public transit, the limited development, and the time it takes. Well, here you go. You've got the rail, you've got the land, you've got the location, you've got neighborhoods that are supportive of it, and here's a major competitive advantage you have to begin getting people off the road, and this fits into this. Fourth is, and this is crucial, you have the development of jobs here, and there are jobs being created in very interesting fields. Creating opportunities for residents to take those jobs is just as important as attracting those jobs. You have five area universities within close proximity. Partnering with them is crucial, and it, uh, there's a lot of talk in Economic Development Day these days, and you'll probably hear it, well, not everybody needs a college education, and maybe that's not the way to go, and there are plenty of it. That's true, there are plenty of occup occupations you don't need a college education, but given what's happened, increased in education, increasing somebody's ability to learn permanently is the, gonna be the survival method of workers going into the future especially given what's happening with automation, the way that climate change is gonna disrupt the economy down here. Each of our individual ability to be able to change jobs, change careers, to be able to continuously adapt is really important in upward economic mobility. So supporting that for North Miami residents, what's interesting, a lot of that policy doesn't happen at the local level. It has to now. The state isn't playing in that game. The feds are pulling out of job training, um, really developing new job training, educational opportunity, and there are a lot of vehicles, a lot of simple vehicles that aren't necessarily even public funded, but getting access to, to hire to quicker, better, faster education and job retraining is crucial for the labor force and maintaining a sustainable economy, even at the city level. Um, I talked about housing as being in a housing is connected directly to jobs in a number of ways. Affordable housing is real important, especially for young workers who are now getting priced out of the Miami market. North Miami actually has a relatively affordable housing stock, which is another major competitive advantage. It's more affordable than the rest of the county. The county is very unaffordable. Um, not that it's as expensive as, as New York and San Francisco. What makes it unaffordable is that wages are lower here, but housing prices are higher, so the gap. Um, in terms of that gap, North Miami is still relatively more affordable than the rest of the county, and that's a competitive advantage, um, especially for younger workers, especially for workers who are just starting out. Uh, they're getting crushed in the housing market. Exactly. Well, North Miami has a housing stock that's not available in the rest of the county, too. I mean, it's still much tighter knit, um, the possibility of being much more urbane. I mean, it just, it's, it's one of three or four places in the county that just don't exist. So you've, you've got this real competitive advantage that way. Just to make one point and then answer your question. And going back to work, housing supports work not just in terms of cost and availability and affordability, but it is increasingly a place to work. So people, now the real, the real modern way to think about housing and jobs is not two separate distinct places and separate, increasingly they're the same place. And not coincidentally, about 60% of all new companies start out in a home. And what's even more interesting is that 60% or 75% of those startups actually stay in a home for the next three years even after they start employing people. So home-based business, working at home, and we're not talking about you know selling baby socks on the internet. Really sophisticated work now, a lot of it takes place in home. 
occupations like digital, uh, digital animators who start at $90,000 a year, average much higher, 98% of them are, are independent, uh, they work for themselves, and 98% of them work from home. So this is very sophisticated work is now taking place in, in your home. So there's no real distinction between work and home anymore. They're, they're pretty much the same. So developing housing, you're developing jobs. Think of them in the same way. <laughs> Some places do really well selling baby socks. I'm not criticizing the sale of baby socks. It's just that... There is very sophisticated work taking place out of the home. It's not, it's not 20 years ago, it was a different story. Uh, now it's a, it's a primary place of work for a lot of, for a lot of high, level, uh, high level occupations. Attorneys, uh, management professionals, consultants. Um. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm not saying that is reality in, in North Miami. I'm saying it's, it's reality in, in everywhere else in the world. And of course, there are pockets, there, there, are, there are pockets everywhere where slumlords and absentee landlords buy property and, and do those kinds of things. I'm not saying you have to have Pixar guys living next year, although it would be wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's here's where the point, the real point is. Here's where the city can begin to take control of its own destiny. This is what we're here to help happen. Realizing how important it is that it's not just. It used to be just about housing. It's now if you are developing incentives for first time home buyers, for home buyers to move to North Miami and purchase and upgrade a home <laughs> to improve it, the benefits are now much more significant than they ever were in the past because in all likelihood, you're not just getting person into a home and they're improving your home, which is a great thing. Taxes go up, your property values go up, the neighborhood gets safer, you know, there's all kinds of benefits. On top of all that, it's a really smart economic development strategy because just so many people are working so many more hours out of the home and there are real simple ways to support that. Uh, Bankam talked about high access to high-speed internet. Simple. Uh, actually, in, in a lot of Miami... Mm, that's not true. That's not true. <coughs> Yeah, most places, typical zoning, if, if you're working in the home without any clients coming to the house, you're just working out of an extra bedroom or a desk, that's, that's your business. Um, usually most cities, though, like South Miami, uh, for example, and the rest of Miami, requires a permit. Once, you have, once people start visiting your home, then you have to go through a zoning process, and that's completely valid. Um, but a lot of people, it's just, you know, they may... They may go three days a week downtown to the shining glass off tower. But more and more what's happening is that they don't. And what's really interesting is that most people don't want to do that commute anymore. And the other advantage is, uh, I'll, I'll end this, the, the housing topic, but the other advantages are real significant in terms of real dollars to other businesses. Think the amount of money that's spent when the population is computing downtown or this 97 per or 94 percent of workers, employed people who live in North Miami, are leaving North Miami every day. Think of the dollars that are lost just from nine to five. 
the lunches that are lost, the dry cleaning, you name it, the number of things that you do close to where you work if it's elsewhere. Now, if all that stuff is kept, or a good chunk of it, more of it starts to be kept in North Miami, you're supporting restaurants, you're supporting other service industries, you're supporting a whole host of industries now that are losing that money because workers are bleeding out. So there's some real advantage, you know, other, it starts to multiply that way. So, and what I'm saying is, again, don't <coughs> think of housing, jobs, economic development as an integrated package, and they, they increasingly are. And I, I hear you about the absentee landlords. It's a, it's a problem across the county as well. Kevin? Can you? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's a great I point. I think we can start with the city as well. Like it could be the easiest one would be the city government. We would have to start, s I mean, it's easy. We're working with the city. We'll start with that. That's a major employer. We can go to the employers first and start looking at that. So we will take the, that as an action item. Yeah, nor in North Miami. Well, it, we'll ask him too. <laughs> that that is fine. But it's it's just about looking at employers, the major employers which are there. Well, and the this city. this is a major major. I mean, North Miami has what's called high employment density. Unlike the most of Miami Dade County, where you have more employed residents living in a place than jobs are in a place, all of the western edge of the county good chunks of the northern part of the county, good chunks. Of, so this is one of the few pockets in North Miami where we actually have more jobs than employed residents. The, the, the real challenge is hooking up your residents to those jobs that are being created here. Having the bulk of jobs, having more jobs than, re than employed residents, though, is a gigantic advantage because it's really hard to create jobs when you don't have them. Kevin, we are ra everyone has yeah, questions, so just if you could just wrap up, please. <laughs> I mean, you just want them to ask some questions. How many this people is know? I love this. How many people know what Y Green is? Okay, that's pretty good. Um, how many people know that North Miami is a Y Green community? Y Green, Y Green is a very innovative program. North Miami is now one of the Y Green communities, where instead of having to go out of pocket on green energy, and it's it's a whole number of things you can do for your home, your business. It's basically energy efficiency solar panels, uh, all kinds of new energy technology, uh, storm windows. Um, instead of going out of pocket, if you want, you can use Y Green financing to take those expenses and put it onto your property taxes and pay it off over up to about 27 years. Um, so it's a very low interest, affordable way, and it's available to businesses as well. Um, marketing that it's a real advantage. It's also a great advantage for those new home buyers. You let them know. A lot of people have no idea. And it's a great way to finance some very expensive improvements, some of the most expensive improvements on your home. Market the hell out of that. Big advantage that North Miami. The last one is, and it seems sort of weird, market sea level rise. Sea level rise is not 2060. It's not 2050. By 2030, in Miami, in Miami-Dade, um, parts of Miami-Dade, the low-lying parts of Miami-Dade, Miami Beach, parts of the rivers, are going to be experiencing 80 days a year of tidal inundation. That means basically almost three months of the year now are going to be flooded on a very serious basis. That starts to disrupt this economy. North most of North Miami, in particular, the rail line, is a coastal ridge. It's actually high and dry through most of the forecast, through almost through three feet of sea level rise. North Miami is still high and dry. Market that. Developers are starting to pay attention to that. Um, you see, you see, still see a lot of condos being built, but the reason they're not rental, they're condos. They're selling a lot of the coastal property. It's somebody else's problem down the line. North Miami unlike a lot of the rest of the county, stays very dry over the next 50, 60 years. That's another huge competitive advantage. Market that as you sell it to home buyers, businesses, all kinds of developers. That's going to be an increasing factor in, in where developers choose to invest in this county in the future. Let me just take one question. 
Oh, there's more slide. Uh, you had this last slide. Do you want to go through it, or you're good? I just uh, I just want to go to the last two. Um, this is no, we're not recommending the smart way that transit facilities and especially mobility is invested in is in a public-private partnership. The smartest way that it's done is that local municipalities find a way to leverage private investment to develop the whole thing. And that's what will help in the, in the, in the final run. Uh, we'll talk about some of those strategies in our final report, but it's really leveraging private investment to build all these facilities, the smartest way to go about it. We're by no means recommending that this is a 100% public or even, even a majority public funded. You want this to be private investment. Um, you also get the biggest bang for the buck. It's usually mixed use, and it creates the most amount of activity, supportive activity around that. Um, but it will take an initial push from the city. The city needs to start preparing for this, preparing its financing, potential funding, and start assembling the properties that are going to be the initial targets to start to launch all of these different initiatives. That's got to start now. Um, can't put it off. Can't wait on that. You got to start preparing to make those investments now, and the city needs to start preparing, and we'll be talking about that as well. Right, and the city and CRA have already started a lot of that, <coughs> which <coughs> we're going to be sharing. <coughs> One of the things that we've been talking about is effective implementation. There's a lot of plans that has been that have been done. We need to start looking at effective implementation. We're saying after this process, we're going to be recommending establishing a mobility hub action team with the city, which could be residents, whoever have been involved with this, so you are the champions for it. When we're talking about the 123rd or 125th, it should not end with this study. It has to go on. You all need to be there fighting for it all the time. That's life. We have to do it. We're talking about improving governance, which is G2G, -G, meaning government to government, between the different agencies, government to citizens. We need to improve that with whatever it takes through increased collaboration, participation, and or, like we talked about, using digital platforms, if that is going to help get people together. Looking at implementing quick win creative placemaking projects that we had talked about, like the 8th Street or activating the plaza with more activities which are going to happen. We need to start looking at that. Kevin already mentioned that we have the cities and the CRA is already looking at land assemblage opportunities. We need to start looking at that. We are going to be giving a list of properties which should be looked at as the strategic notes to the CRA. They will have to start the negotiations, which they're looking into already. We'll have to also be giving recommendations. We will be doing that to update the zoning code, to incorporate more transit supportive regulations based on what we have been telling you today. And it was your turn, but I think we allowed for questions. Typically, we don't do that. No, we're going to go back to questions now. Well, Jessica, we're going to start with you, for sure. But I just want to go to that uh, last slide, please. This is a concept plan, which um, we've got some printouts, which we'll hand over to you. Please take it back, review whatever we've said, mark it on it, give it back to the CRA, come to the city hall, come to the plaza, just hand it over back to them. That's the traditional way. The other thing that we also have is uh, we're going to be give me a second. We're going to be sharing this link with you on the city's website on the. North Miami website, which is essentially the smart city platform. It is going to be an interactive map of what we have proposed. And you all will get a chance to go ahead and just go at a point, and then this thing would come in, whatever we're proposing. You could go give your recommendations on it. So do it with a glass of wine, with a bottle of wine, whatever <laughs> makes you just feel relaxed. Don't be too angry. We're just trying to improve this place. And just give us your input, right? And I think we're good. Thank you so much. But the questions are going to follow, right? I'm going to follow you. Thanks. Jessica, please. Right. Hey, Jessica. I, I, I just want to make sure that you remember that the whole of North Miami is not only this east side. And you must include some access or ways that people who live on the green west side of Miami, specifically Sun Kiss Grove, will have access and be able to participate in this expansion or this uh, new thing you're doing? Absolutely. Because of your um, recommendation in the first workshop, okay. we included, I've said the presentation, it will be on the website. We included a lot of recommendations okay. to co okay. connect okay. better. That. That's why I remembered your name. All right, now number two. No. no. There are other people. Right there are other people. Right yeah. Right you talk about mobility a lot, but 
but you exclude mobility to the disabled. Mobility to people who may have mobility issues. You need to, I would like to see an inclusion <coughs> in your planning of people who have a, may have a different degrees of limiting ability in mobility as well. Because that was a failure on Bright Line. Bright Line did not I think no, we need to include universal accessibility. We did miss that in our discussion. Please. The age friendly, no, we, we, we did put age friendly neighborhoods and we had that as part of it, which was looking at children as well as the disabled, as well as the aged, yes. senior citizens. Yes. Absolutely, that's there. Again, I need to give you the plan because it's already there, whatever you've said. <laughs> All right. Part of the economic development in North, <coughs> excuse me, of North Miami is that we need the more infrastructure improvements. Our sewage systems are crumbling. The city's not recognizing a lot of this. Uh, we have off of 131st and Griffin Boulevard, we had sewage coming up during Hurricane Irma. Uh, unfortunately, one of our neighbors is still unable to live in her house because of the sewage uh, situation. And we have another house on the same corner that might have to sell their house to the city because of that. Uh, none of this was presented. And all, all of this is based off of proper infrastructure underneath the streets before we can go. We do have a local uh, infrastructure consultant on the team okay. who is looking at and working with the city on all the recommendations okay. of improving that. Private and public. Yes. Private and public, excuse me. I just wanted to say about the, um, I want to make sure that, yeah, you do really implement proper bicycle lanes as much as possible. And I like the idea of the 16th Avenue, uh, when you're trying to go north, of so 16th Avenue as you pass the park. Then it joins with West Dixie. And if you could grab onto West Dixie from there and actually go north, make it, make it um, worthwhile for commuters because then people, for cycling, yeah. safe bike lanes. Because I think you have the opportunity to be able to do it with the combination of 16th Avenue to where it joins to West Dixie, because West Dixie south of that we know is kind of crazy now with this all going yeah, on. But if yeah. you have somehow figure out the best way to connect it from this hub to get to the 16th Avenue, proper bike lanes with the buffer is the best idea to West Dixie, and then take it north as far as you can. I know you guys, that's out of your circle. I don't know it deals with, um, you have to deal with county, city, and state, because they all have a different piece of it, but if people can, if they can all just like work together and make that happen, that'd be, I think, very useful. Make it actually for commuter friendly. Yeah, and we view it as, as it's an integrated system. And uh, just uh, to make it clear, there is the, the Greenway Trail idea came because the, the, the roadway corridors aren't always easily adaptable to bicycle traffic in, in terms of creating lanes and so forth. So one of the ideas was we'll, we'll move that off into vacant land and areas that are considered environmental but can accommodate a bicycle. And uh, the second part of that is getting from the north end of our project area, which is Enchanted Forest, pretty much, to the south end, which is the park recreation facility, was a high priority for us. North and, and south circulation was an important issue for us. There's only a few places where you can cross the railroad track. 16th, 16th is one yeah. of them. Yeah. So that's why we're looking at that. Yeah, that's, I like that. And then I wanted to answer, well, they're gone now, but what they were saying about how, um, to, how to research why the people that live further out and then come to here, why don't they live here? I could, it seems like obvious. The houses here are smaller and older, and they don't want that. They want to get more bang for the buck, go further out, get more land, a bigger house. To get that here, I mean, to get that size here, you'd have to be in Keystone Point and spend millions. So yep. that's the obvious answer is that it's just an older city, older houses, which I prefer, but that's not what the majority Yeah, and the economists can address this better than I can. But the when, the commuting <laughs> when the commuter cost <coughs> goes high enough, that draws people back into the city closer to where they need yeah, to so be. I know there, there is a few corridors, I think six or seven corridors that uh, the county is working on in terms of trail. I don't know how you will be able to incorporate or make the relation between uh, your project and the tra existing trails that they are working on. I know there is one coming from FIU, uh, so if, if it, it can be connected to, uh, to this plan, 
And I'm glad also that you mentioned the first uh, and last mile, which is very important in, uh, in your project, as well as um, something else I had in mind. The first, la first mile, last mile, the, the trails, and uh, I forgot the other one, but I will mention <laughs> it in, in uh, Please, please. Yes, in, your in, in an email to you. All right, thank you so much. And uh, all of you, please have a good night, but there's one more comment. We have to let him sit have the last word. Um, the one thing that this city does not promote, mm -hmm. number one is the, the location. We're between Miami International Airport and Fort Lauderdale International Airport. So we're in the middle. I mean, you go up and down the boulevard here, which I do every day. Biscayne Boulevard is not going to get enlarged. So we need that, we need rail, and we need more stations along the tri-rail route to get people off the boulevard and start using the trains. And the trains have to run on time, just like Chicago, every six minutes. You know, dependability. People are not going to use mass transit when it's not dependable. Absolutely. That's number one. Number two, you brought the point about us being um, not flooded. That's the truth. In 1947, there was a hurricane that came through here, hit Dayton Broward, turned around at Cape Canaveral, and came back down. All of this area was flooded except one area, this area. That when the building boom began here in 1947, people started buying houses here. All right. So that's my two points. Thank you so much. All right, thanks. Everyone, please, we will please visit the website, which is there, and also send us an email if you have any questions, any comments. Um, and we will see you again. We will be having, if you would like to meet with us, just send us an email. And Sarah would tell you that I do come and meet you personally. <laughs> <laughs>